you have his word, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to Genesis chapter 1. So the very first chapter, first book in the Bible. And let me invite you to also pull out the notes that you received in the worship guide when you, when you came in that will guide our time together tonight. We're going to be, in a sense, all over the Bible got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to be in two main passages, Genesis 1 through 3, and then you might go ahead and mark. We're going to go later to Romans chapter 5 in the New Testament as we we talk tonight about the cross and Christian manhood. It's obviously Father's Day, and in light of the massive confusion and misperception, not only in our culture, but in the church regarding what it means to be a man— I believe it is valuable for us to pause tonight in our journey through the book of 1 Corinthians where we're seeing the effect of the cross of Christ on Christian community. For us to pause much like we did on Mother's Day and we consider the effect of the cross on Christian womanhood. For us to pause tonight on Father's Day and consider the effect of the cross on the way we understand manhood. And I want to honor you, brothers, men in this room, on this night, but at the same time, I want to challenge you just to be plain, frank. My, my heart is heavy tonight, personally and pastorally. S- studying for tonight, today, has been challenging personally as, as I've walked through this sermon in my own heart and with my own wife and tried with her to look honestly at my life and I have seen many areas where I have a need to grow as a man. And pastorally, I am praying that in the next few minutes, God might wake up men all across this room to see just how skewed our understanding of manhood is in our culture and to stop acquiescing to that culture and to rise up by the grace of God to be the men, single men, husbands, fathers that God has created and called us to be. So I want to speak clearly, even sternly at points because I'm convinced this is a huge need in our culture and in the church and in families, future families represented all across this room. So I'm going to speak specifically to men tonight. So women, you're going to be overhearing in a sense, but in a way that I hope will be good for you, in a way that I hope will help you as women know how to pray for men around you, for married women to know how to pray for your husbands, for children to know how to pray for your dads, for single women to know what to look for in a man when it comes to marriage. I would would even say for women who have, I know all across this room, been hurt by men in various ways in your life, My hope is, especially where we end, that you will find healing tonight for your heart when it comes to hurt that you have experienced from men in your life or even are experiencing now from men in your life. And and then as a whole, for, for you as a woman to know how God has designed you in a way that complements man for your good and ultimately for his glory. So that's where we're going to start tonight with God's design for men and really for women in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. So Genesis 1, 26, follow along with me there as I read the word of God. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male 
and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. All right, so, so let's stop there. What do we learn here about God's design for men and women in this first chapter of the Bible? Well, first and foremost, and this is in your notes, clearly God created men and women with equal dignity. So in verse 26, God creates man and woman in his image, both of them with equal value before him, equal dignity before each other. This is where any conversation about manhood must begin. From the start of the Bible, God, in his word, loudly speaks against any kind of male superiority or male dominance. In any culture, in any relationship, where man is thought to be better than woman, where A woman is treated as inferior in any way. Then we are undercutting the very design of God. For all of eternity, no sex, man or woman, is inferior or superior, greater than the other. We all have equal dignity before God. Verse 28 says that God blessed man and woman, not just with dignity, but with dominion over all creation together. A truth that's echoed in Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 through 8. It talks about how God has crowned us as men and women with glory and honor over and above everything else in all creation. So God created man and woman both with great dignity, with equal dignity before each other, value before Him. At the same time, truth number two, God created men and women with different roles. And This is where we come to Genesis chapter 2. So look at the next chapter in the Bible, which is a parallel account of the creation of man, but it gets into more specifics about how God created man and woman. So go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And I want you to listen here for the distinct, try to see the distinct reasoning behind the creation of woman and the subsequent roles that God gives to man and woman as he creates them. Look at verse 15. Chapter 2, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought him to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay, so see the picture here. Notice that God didn't just immediately create woman right after he created man. Instead, God parades all these animals before man for him to name them. What's the point of that? Well, it's not just to tell us about how animals were named. The whole point here is to show us that man was alone, that there was no one like him. He's looking at all these animals. He's considering names that match their natures. And as he sees them all, he comes to the conclusion, there's no one who shares the same nature as me. So he takes a nap and God performs the first surgical operation. While he's sleeping, God takes one of his ribs. Now remember, man was formed from dust. God obviously could have created woman in the exact same way, but he doesn't. Instead, God takes part of Adam's side, not from his head, his feet, from his side, next to where his heart is, a picture of how a woman would be in the deepest sense of the word, his partner. Literally, as the text says, his helper, verse 18, God intentionally forms a helper fit for man. And so then, there she stands, formed by God, like man, but different from man. And so then God touches the man, wakes him up, and says, you have one more creature to name. Adam opens his eyes, and needless to say, he is thrilled. 
The first words ever recorded of human speaking. And it's, it's poetry. It's like song. It's like he's going nuts singing. Yes, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man because she was taken out of man. Now, obviously, man and woman created in this way to complement one another physically in a way that they would multiply together throughout the earth. So we're not going to go into a birds and bees explanation here, but I hope this is obvious. Man and woman physically created to complement one another. But this complementary relationship doesn't start with just physical, stop with just physical characteristics. There's also a relational complementarity here. Look, look at it. And, and, and realize this, we're diving into this. This is a truth from the beginning of the Bible that is being denied, disregarded, twisted today into all kinds of ideas and characters, caricatures that are not the design of God. And ultimately, this complementary relationship between man and woman in so many ways in our culture is being ignored, even by many in the church. So just realize, when we're diving into this from the beginning of the Bible, the Bible is taking us against the grain of political correctness in our day from the start. But if we will listen to what the Bible is saying, we will see a beauty in this relationship between men and women that we are so missing in our culture today. So follow this here in Genesis 2, then reflect it all over the Bible. Man was created to be the head, to be the head. Now, as soon as I use that word, I want to be clear how I'm using it, how the Bible uses it. This is the exact language the Bible, Bible uses later in this book that we're studying. We're going to get to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Paul says there, he looks back to Genesis 2 and he says, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. So the Bible teaches that a, the head of a wife is her husband. Ephesians 5, 23, which is a verse we'll look at in a little bit says the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. And when the Bible uses this term head, it's referring to a leadership role. Again, this is not male domination. This is not greater dignity. That would go completely against God's design. We're talking here about role. And that's a distinction that is familiar to all of us. So I'm a father. I have four children. I have a position of leadership in their life. And that's a good position of leadership that's been designed by God. It doesn't mean that I'm any more valuable than they are, that I have more dignity than them, that I'm more human than they are. No. It's simply a picture of a role that God has designed for me as their father for their good. It's a good role. So man here in Genesis 2 is created to be the head, to lead with love in his relationship with woman, to lead with love, to provide and protect her. We we read in Genesis 2, 15 through 17, that man was given the responsibility of working this garden in order to provide. When we get to the next chapter, Genesis 3, which we're going to read in a second, we realize that man is accountable to God for protecting his wife, not just physically, but spiritually. Man created to lead his wife as head with love to provide for and protect his wife. And really not just his wife, but women generally. And we know this. We know this. We all know. Okay, you got two guys and two ladies walking together down the street and some attacker approaches the group, there's something wrong if the two guys step back and say, ladies, save us. Those are not men. By God's design from the beginning, man is accountable for protection. Any husband who rolls over next to his wife in bed and says, I heard a strange noise downstairs. Will you go check it out? That guy's got issues. He's not a man. He is a boy who is outside of the design of God. A leader provides and protects with love and feels the accountability for that kind of provision and protection. So man created to be the head, to lead with love, to protect and to provide for woman. And woman was created to be the helper. This is the word that's used twice in Genesis 2 to describe woman. First, verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Go down to verse 20. The Bible says, amidst all creation, there was not found a helper fit for him. And the Bible says this was not good. It's really interesting. The beginning, you read through Genesis 1, you see God created this and it was good. God created this and it was good. Everything was good. You get to the end of Genesis 1, 31, everything was very good. But then you get to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, before sin has even entered the world, and you see the words, it was not good. 
So there was something that was not good before sin even came into the world. And what was not good was man was alone. He needed a helper that was like him with equal dignity, made in the image of God, but also different from him to complement him with a different role from him. You say, this, this all sounds denigrating, offensive to women. You're chauvinistic. And, and the reason we think that the reason we are so confused in our culture in this is, is because, well, on one hand, this idea has been very abused. We're going to talk about that. And it's misunderstood and misperceived. See the original design of God here. Go into third, third truth here. God created men and women. Why he created men and women this way? As a reflection of the Trinity. God created men and women this way in a complementary relationship as a reflection of himself. So see the beauty of equality and differences in men and women and the very nature of God. Quick review of the Trinity. God exists as one God in three persons. We just read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 how God refers to himself as us. So there's one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Mystery of the Trinity. Now think about it. The persons of the Trinity, are they all equally God? equally divine. Yes, the Father is completely God. The Son is fully God. The Spirit is fully God. All of them God. Are they different in role? Yes, they are different in role. I put put Genesis 1, 1 and John 1, 1 there. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1, 1. And then you get to John 1, 1, talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is a reference to Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is equated with God, fully divine. And through Jesus, through the Word, all things were made. So this equates Jesus and God. But then you get to passage like John 5, 19 through 23. You see Jesus, the Son. So God the Son saying, I submit to the leadership of God the Father. And so you see this picture of different role. The Son is subject to the Father. The Father is the head of the Son. 1 Corinthians 11.3 that I just mentioned a second ago. Paul writes, I want you to understand the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. See it, the Bible teaches that there's headship and helping in the very nature of God. The Father is the head of the Son. Is that bad? Is that chauvinistic, denigrating, offensive to the Son? Not at all. This is good. We are so programmed in our culture to think that these terms are bad and they imply domination. That they make one inferior to the other. We think, well, if there's difference, then that means one su- inferior, one superior. Not true. Not true in the Godhead. Not true in God's design for man and woman. There is in God loving leadership in the Father's relationship to the Son. Neither of them inferior or superior. Neither of them domineering or denigrated. Instead, together they're one, loving and leading being led and being loved with equal worth and value. This is loving leadership in the context of beautiful relationship. And that is God's good design from the beginning of creation for man and woman. God's design for men. Now, the reason we react against this is because of sin's distortion of men and women in Genesis 3. So turn there with me to this this entrance of sin into the world. And as we read this, Genesis chapter 3, your first few verses here, I want, you to, I want you to see how sin came into the world and I want you to see the relationship between sin and men and sin and women and the roles men and women play and the effects of sin on men and women. Watch this. Ephesians chapter, or Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Okay, I want want to show you here how sin specifically relates to and affects men and women in different ways. We're focusing here on, on men. So certainly for all of us, men and women, 
Sin separates us from God. Sin is rebellion against God. But I want you to see how sin plays out in the man's life here in Genesis 3 in two primary ways. One in a passive way and then one in an aggressive way. And then I want us to think about practically how men in this room, we reflect exactly what's going on here in sinful tendencies in each of our lives. So we'll start with passive. Notice that sin leads men man in Genesis 3 and men all together to abdicate their responsibilities. This is the essence of what Adam did in Genesis 3, 1 through 5. You say, well, Adam didn't do anything in verses 1 through 5. Precisely. Notice how the serpent, in the very way he tempted this couple, subverted the design of God in man and woman. He did not come to man. He came to the woman. From the very beginning, he undercut the headship of man, saying, Eve, you lead the way here. And Adam, from all we can tell, was standing right beside her while Eve led out. You realize why this is so important. When you get down to Genesis 3, verse 17, and God is disciplining man for his sin, listen to what he says. He says, Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Notice this. Adam called out by God, yes, for eating the fruit, but even before that, for listening instead of leading, for ignoring the command that if you remember, we read Genesis 2, 17, the man was given. God gave the man this command not to eat fruit from this tree before the woman was even formed. And so here in Genesis 3, you have man abdicating, forsaking, abandoning his responsibility to lead sitting back and doing nothing. He should have stood up and said, serpent, you have no business questioning my wife about the commands God has given. Those commands came directly to me. It's my responsibility to be be faithful in carrying them out. You can talk to me. Instead, he sits silently by like a wimp and does absolutely nothing. So that's one distortion of manhood here. Man sitting back and abdicating his responsibility to lead. But then, I want you to go ahead and jump down your notes here. See the other side of the picture. Then we'll think about how this plays out practically. The other distortion of man in Genesis 3 that we see is sin, in an aggressive way, leads men to abuse their authority. You look down in Genesis 3, 16. After sin enters the world, God says to Eve, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, this is obviously part of the curse of sin and its effect on woman, but I want you to notice how it relates to man. Because that word for rule there is not to lead in a good way, but to assert authority by power or force. It's a word that's oftentimes used in the Old Testament to describe oppression. And the whole picture is that Adam, in his distorted manhood, would rule, would lead with a harshness and a forcefulness that was not the design of God. This is where you then cross the spectrum, swing the pendulum to the other side of man's sinfulness. Here man is not abdicating his responsibility to lead, but he's abusing his authority as a leader. Man rises up and says, okay, I'm not going to be a wimp in this relationship. I'm going to dominate this relationship. This is why I was careful earlier to say headship is not the same as domination. Headship in Genesis 2 was good, but in Genesis 3 as a result of sin, headship becomes domination and force, a selfish abuse of authority. Men seeking to control and abuse their position of leadership in their relationship with women. Now, you step back and you think about it. We see both of these pictures today all across not just our culture, but across the church and in this room, men. We reflect both of these sinful distortions of God's design. So what I've done is I put in your notes just some practical pictures of the way this plays out in different men. I was driving back last week late one night from out of town and trying to stay awake and listening to a sermon from Mark Driscoll on men and marriage and and that will help you stay awake listening to a sermon from Mark Driscoll. But he, he helped point out some practical pictures of, of distortions of manhood. And it got me thinking. And so I wrote down what you got in your notes there are, are ten pictures, portraits of different men 
different ways just to help us get some practical handles on the way these sinful tendencies play out in our lives. And I want to share them with you. And men, as I do, I want to challenge you to put your pride aside for a moment and honestly ask the question, how are these sinful tendencies playing out in your life? So we'll start with the passive effects of sin on men. So ways that men abdicate their responsibilities before God. Let me give you some examples. We'll start with won't grow up Walter. So this is the guy in this room who lives in perpetual adolescence. He's in his 20s, 30s, maybe even in his 40s. And the main reason he's not taken a wife is because he has no idea where he would take her. He lacks direction, vision, His life revolves around him and what he wants to do, but he's still figuring out what he wants to do. He's eight years into his undergraduate studies, and he works part-time because it stresses him out. He leans on his mom to help him pay the bills. He's a nice guy who meets with people and has coffee. He's always looking for a mentor, but even when he gets one, he doesn't do what the mentor says because the reality is he's not ready to take responsibility. He just wants to find himself, but he won't take responsibility for himself or others. So he plays video games like a little boy. Or maybe it's some other hobby that's more important to him than the mission for which God has created him. He's abdicating the responsibility that God has given him as a man, not only for himself, but for a wife and children because he just won't grow up. Or then there's absent from reality Andy. So Andy has gotten married. He has a wife and he has kids and he pays the bills. He takes responsibility for putting food on the table. But that's where Andy's responsibility stops. He sits around the table with his wife and his kids, and though he's physically present with them, he is emotionally distant from them. He never asks his wife how she feels. He has no clue what's going on in the hearts of his children. Why? Because he's on his phone all the time, or on the computer, or plopped on the couch watching TV, or out in the garage working on his car. He's the husband and the dad who's there, but not really there. He's totally absent from the reality of what's going on below the surface in the people who are around him. Or then there's Too Cool Carl, the guy that everybody likes. He's funny, he's entertaining. Always got a good joke, good quip to get people laughing. He's the life of the party. The only problem is everybody likes him, but no one respects him. He wants so much to be liked by his kids that he refuses to discipline them. He leaves that to his wife. He wants so much to be liked by the people around him that he'll never confront serious issues facing people around him. He wants to be what everybody wants him to be. And so he refuses to stand up for what's good and right, particularly when it's costly. And there comes a point when even his cool, funny antics get pretty annoying to his wife and his kids. She wants a real husband. They want a real dad who they can respect and not just laugh at. And then there's blame it on everybody and everything else, Bob. This is the guy who has all kinds of reasons why he's not the man God has designed him to be. This or that happened to him when he was young. This or that is happening to him right now. He didn't have a father to show him what manhood looks like. And I want to be really careful here because I know that a huge number of males in this room did not have a good father. Or any father for that matter. And many of you have experienced things in your life that have been extremely challenging. And I'm not saying those things don't affect us. But have you ever noticed here that as soon as Adam was confronted by God for his lack of leadership in Eve's life, the first thing he did was to blame Eve. Verse 12, Genesis 3, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Notice Adam's blaming doesn't even stop just with Eve. Adam blames God. You're the one who gave her to me. So technically, God, when you think about it, you did this. You made me this way. Mantra of our day. I am this way. My circumstances make me this way. Blame it on everybody and everything else, Bob. Refuses to take responsibility for being the man God's created him to be because others are at fault. Maybe even God is at fault, but not him. And then there's rest in retirement, Ron. Notice in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, that God created men with the specific purpose of working in the garden. Man was created to work. Work is not a product of the fall. Toil and trouble in work are a product of the fall, but not work itself. Work is a good thing that God created men to do. Yet you look in our skewed culture today, what is the goal held up for every man? 
retire from work as soon as possible. And so you've got all kinds of men who are living for the day when they don't have to work anymore, when they can just rest and relax and do what they want to do apart from work. And other men who are doing exactly that, who've retired and are coasting this, things out, this thing out. Christian men resting and relaxing until heaven finally comes, when it's unbiblical. Retirement, perpetual rest from work is unbiblical. Now, I'm not talking about those who have physical limitations from certain types of work. I'm not talking about those who technically retire, but retirement for them means that now they're free to work in all kinds of ways in the world for the glory of God without needing a salary. What a great thing that is. But our goal, men, is not to be free from work. That misses the whole point of what we were created for as men, and it abdicates one of our primary responsibilities before God. And yet it's what our our culture encourages at every turn. So these are some of the passive pictures of manhood we see in us and around us. Maybe some fit these profiles exactly. Maybe there are parts of them that we tend toward. Or maybe you're thinking, oh, okay, I'm free from all those. Well, then we swing the pendulum to the other side. Aggressive, selfish abuse of authority. So think about tough guy Tom. This is the guy who thinks that to be a man is to do the opposite of what women do. So women hug and kiss their kids. So this guy doesn't hug and kiss his kids. Women say, I love you. So this guy never says, I love you. This guy's tough. He thinks he doesn't show emotions when the reality is the only emotion his wife and kids see is that he's distant from them and domineering over them. He barks orders at them. Maybe even he abuses them emotionally. Verbally, physically, what kind of coward of a man asserts his manhood by hurting women and children? Tough guy Tom thinks that being a man means being in charge wherever he is, whether it's at home, at work, in the church. He can't submit to authority because he is the authority. Nobody tells him what to do because he's a man. The reality is he's an insecure little boy who tries to cover up his insecurity by being stronger than the next guy, tougher than the next guy, louder than the next guy. That's success for tough guy Tom. Then there's there's get what I want Gary whose aggression leads him to please himself no matter what it costs others. He's the single guy who preys on single girls and charms them emotionally to get whatever he wants from them physically. He's like scores of males across this room who get their kicks downloading pictures and videos of women or men. He thinks he's a man, but he's a boy who can only find pleasure with himself in his room alone with a phone or computer screen. Or maybe he acts on his impulses with somebody else, leaving his wife and his kids behind because he doesn't care about anybody but himself. He's get what I want, Gary. He leads for one thing, whatever works best for him. Or then there's living for what won't last Larry. This is the guy who's not sitting back in laziness. He's working hard. But that's just where the problem comes in. He works so hard that... He defines himself by what he does, how well he does it, the success and status he attains in doing it. He makes money. He gets possessions. He acquires positions. And he thinks that what, that's what matters. He doesn't realize that in the end, it's all going to burn up. It's not going to matter how much money he made, what position he acquired. He's run after all these things that the world has said are most important. But in the end, he's going to have nothing eternally to show for it. And the sad thing is, he thinks that's the best way to lead and love his kids. So he gives them what they want, and he spends time with them. The only problem is, as he spends time with them, he's teaching them to do what he's done, run after the things of this world. So living for what won't last, Larry runs his kids all over town, playing football, baseball, basketball, soccer, golf, hours and hours and hours on end, talking sports, practicing sports, other hobbies. And it's not that those things are bad in and of themselves. What's bad is that he's never spent hours teaching them what matters, like how to know God and how to read and study His Word and how to pray and how to share the gospel and fulfill the purpose for which we're on the planet. He's never spent hours teaching his sons and daughters to grow as men and women of God. He neglects those things. And in the end, he leads his children and his wife to bank their lives on what doesn't matter. And his family one day is going to end up with all the things that Larry said are most important burning up. And they're going to be left with nothing in their hands. And it will be because of him. 
a selfish abuse of his leadership that his kids will pay for in their lives. Now and in eternity. And then there's can't put work down Dan who knows he's created to work but has forgotten that there are other things in life besides work. His work controls him. He can't get away from it. He has no boundaries. His phone is always on. He's always checking his emails. He's always finishing up just one more thing. But there's just one more thing that just keep coming. Other people set his agenda because he's not man enough to set an agenda himself. He prioritizes what other people want him to do over uninterrupted, uninhibited time with his wife and his kids. Because he can't say no to things that don't matter in his work, he inevitably says no to people that do matter in his life. And finally, there's put a good face on it, Frank. And this guy just sums it up because regardless of what his issues are, regardless of the weaknesses that there are in his marriage or with his kids and his home and his life, more than anything else, he just wants to cover it up. He just wants to move on from this sermon as soon as possible. He wants to pretend like these things are not that big a deal. He doesn't want to talk about any of these things when he gets in the car in a few minutes with his wife or his kids because he's afraid to admit his weaknesses. And there's going to be a strange silence in this man's life from this sermon until he finally realizes that he's not really the man he thought he was. And he's going to have a choice. Every single male in this room has a choice. Will you, on the one hand, refuse to acknowledge the passive and aggressive effects of sin in your life as a man? Will you cover these things up? Will you move on from them as quickly as you can, content to live under the cultural illusion that you are a man when the reality is no matter how old you are, you're a little boy who won't own up to what it really means to be a man? Or on the other hand, will you rise up and realize that in and of yourself, because of the sin in your heart and life, in my heart and life, you and I are prone to all of these things, that we are prone to abdicate our responsibility before God, prone to abuse our authority from God. Will we realize this, and will we repent of the way it plays out in each of our lives? Will you humbly come before the God who made you and admit that apart from his grace, you will never be the man he has created you to be? Will you go to your wife and your kids tonight, tomorrow, sometime soon, to the people you know best, and say to them, where, where do I need to grow? Which of these is me? And you humbly listen and you humbly respond because you know you need the grace of God in your life as a man. This is the place that I pray God will bring men all across this room to tonight. See it. Christ-like devotion in men. Christ in manhood. So right in the middle of this chapter, that's manhood marred by sin in Genesis 3. In the middle, Genesis 3.15, God promises to send a man from the line of woman who would crush the adversary in the world. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. He, he, a man, is going to bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's a promise that God is going to send a man born of woman to defeat sin, to defeat Satan, to conquer the effects of sin, and to redeem every man and woman who trusts in him. So right after the first sin of the first man in the world, we have a promise that another man is coming. And the good news of the gospel is that man has come. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus perfectly models true manhood. He is the man that we are all supposed to be like. But not only is he this, this ideal out here that we got to strive to attain. No, not only does he perfectly model true manhood, but he mercifully saves us from our sin and from ourselves. He dies on the cross to pay the price for our sins as men against God, for all of our abdication of responsibility, all of our abuse of authority. Jesus takes the payment for our sin, to free us from our sin on the cross, so that when we confess our need for his grace, confess him as Savior and Lord, turn from our sin and ourselves, trust in him as Savior and Lord, he will free us from the bondage that sin has on our hearts as men, and not just free us, Jesus personally then makes us into the men God created us to be. And, and this is where the cross comes in. So the cross and manhood. You maybe have marked Romans chapter 5. If not, turn over to Romans 5 with me. And this is where I want to make the connection between what we just read in Genesis 3.15 and Genesis 1-3 through 3 really and, and Romans chapter 5. So in, in verse 12 of Romans chapter 5, we see 
contrast the New Testament between Adam, the first man, and Christ, the new man. And then the term man in here in Genesis and Romans chapter 5 is used to describe generically all men and women together. But I want you to think about manhood and specifically men as we read through this passage and see the connection. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there's no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, how much more the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many." And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, see it. One man's sin, right? Adam's sin, one man's sin brought condemnation to all men. Every man in this room has sinned. We all have propensities to sin in these varied ways. But then, see it, another man has come. Jesus Christ, and he is the perfect man who perfectly obeyed God as man, even to the point of dying on a cross. And through his death for our sins, we can be made righteous men before God. So don't miss the point. It's the whole point of tonight. There has only been one man in all of history, one man on the landscape of human history who was really a man as God designed him to be. And so the only way for you and I to be men is to be found in that one man. And that is only possible by turning from ourselves and trusting in who he is and what he has done for us. And this is where we realize you cannot be a man as God has designed you to be apart from the cross of Jesus Christ. It is only in the cross, through the cross, by the cross of Christ that you can ever become the man God has designed you to be whole point. When you humble yourself, men, brothers, when you throw aside your boyish pride and you admit your need for the mercy of God to make you a man in Christ, he will do exactly that. And and he's doing it. We're hitting hard on some of these ways, these tendencies in our own lives, but praise God. So we should be challenged at the same time. Be affirmed in ways that you're experiencing victory as men in some of these things. Some of these, some of these things we've talked about, you used to be. To use language from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. You once were those things, but now you're not. In Christ, you're growing in Christ, and you're, you're thriving in Christ. is becoming more and more the man God's created you to be. Praise God for that. When you hear, well, this, this portrait or that portrait, you think, well, I used to be that guy, but I'm not that guy anymore. Don't think, well, I'm glad I'm not that guy. Realize that apart from the grace of God, you would be that guy. But by the grace of God, you are becoming the man that he has created you to be by the power of the cross. Think about it. Think about how the cross compels us to manhood, to true manhood. This is where I want to give some pastoral, practical exhortations. So some of you are thinking, I mean, somebody came up to me after uh, worship gathering this morning and said, man, we got a triage unit 
set up in the back for men tonight after the sermon. So my, my goal is not just to say, all right, here's all the problems. All right, let's close it up and go home and feel horrible. It's the, the goal is to drive us to Christ and in Christ to become the men that God has created us to be. It's there for us. He is there for us. And so here's some exhortations acknowledging, brothers, that this is not something that happens overnight. It's a lifelong journey of becoming the men God has created us to be. So where do you begin? Well, begin at the cross and see that the cross compels us in these ways. First, the cross compels us to initiate humble, hardworking leadership in our lives. Initiate humble, hardworking leadership. Every word there, important. This is what the cross is all about. The cross, think about it, is the place where Jesus, as a man, took responsibility for men and, and women. He took the initiative. He humbly came to us. He walked the hard road to the cross in order that we might be saved. See his loving leadership at the cross. See it and then be compelled by it. Initiate humble, hardworking leadership in your life, in every area of your life. Strive for purity. Be holy. Men, be holy as God is holy. First Peter 1. Practice spiritual disciplines. Take initiative in your walk with God. Men, are you in the Word? Are you long in prayer? Are you walking in obedience to Him? Prayer, the Word, fasting, worship, witnessing. If we're going to be disciplined about anything, don't let it be video games or working out or getting a paycheck or hunting or fishing or following this or that sport or listening to this or that music. What are you going to say when you stand before God and you spend hours of your discipline on these things? If we're going to be disciplined about anything, be disciplined in your pursuit of God and godliness. Practice spiritual disciplines. Flee sexual immorality. Be a one-woman man. Husbands, have eyes for no one, no one but your wife. Single guys, keep your eyes and your hands off of anyone who is not your wife. Flee all forms of sexual immorality. Heterosexual, homosexual, pornographic, in-person, thought, desire, deed. Flee it, men. And just so you know, we're going to spend time in depth for the next couple of weeks talking about how to do this. Not just as men, but as men and women in this sex-crazed culture. How do, we, how do we flee sexual immorality? Fight material idolatry. Your life is not defined by how much you make and how much you have. Get out of the rat race that says this is what makes a man. It's what makes a fool. Fight material idolatry. Cultivate personal integrity in your life, in your family, in your work. What kind of man are you when no one but God is looking? Strive for purity. Take responsibility, brothers. Men, take responsibility in your life. As a single man, take responsibility for starting a family. Now, caveat here. We're going to talk more about singleness in a few weeks when we get to 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to see in Scripture the value of singleness, a goodness in singleness for the glory of God, for those whom God calls to that. At the same time, and I'm speaking to men specifically here, if there's going to be any marriage in the world, which by the way is a really good thing, by God's design, marriage is going to happen because you as single men take responsibility for starting families. Single guys, this is your responsibility. You don't wait for some girl to ask you out. It is your responsibility to lead. And if she rejects you, it is your responsibility to make it as easy as possible for her to reject you. Don't make that hard on her. You humbly bow out. So single brothers, figure out where you're going. Take responsibility for getting there and take responsibility for taking someone with you there. Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to a wife. So take responsibility for starting a family and take responsibility, men, for shepherding a family. That's husbands and fathers in every way. 
spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, physically, relationally. I'm thinking here, Mark 12, Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. So take responsibility for leading, shepherding your family to do those things. Husbands, dads, you are the shepherds in your family responsible before God for your family's spiritual, emotional, intellectual, physical, relational state. So spiritually, men, husbands, is your wife flourishing in her relationship with Christ? You say, well, I'm not, I'm not sure. We don't, really, we don't really talk about that. Or, well, that's between her and God. No, this is your responsibility before God to shepherd her to flourish in her relationship with Christ. Are your children flourishing in their relationships with Christ? So I'm just kind of leaving that to them. The worst thing a dad could say when he has been entrusted with the responsibility, the privilege, and the opportunity to shepherd children to know God and love God. People say, well, I pay for Christian school. I take my kids to church. I do. I've done my Christian duty. If that's all you've done, you are abdicating your responsibility. It is your responsibility to teach your kids to pray, to show your kids how to study the Bible, to show your kids how to share their faith. This is your job to shepherd them. People say, I don't know where to start. Well, start by praying with your wife. Start by praying with your kids. Start, read the Bible with them. Talk about God with them. If you haven't already, then lead your family to become a member, committed member of a church where they and you can grow and help others grow in Christ. Shepherd your family spiritually, emotionally. Your wife wants you to know her. And she wants to know you. Which we know requires more than just sitting in the same room with her or sleeping in the same bed with her. This requires work, initiative, sitting down with your wife and asking her how she feels. What is the state of your wife's heart? How can you best serve her heart? Take the initiative. Don't wait for her to come to you. Your wife should not come. Our wife should not come to us and say, there's some problems in my life or in marriage that we need to talk about. We need to be starting those conversations. Initiating. Preventing. Turn off the TV. Stop hiding on the ball field or behind your work and ask your wife how you can love her better. It's your responsibility. And she'll love you for it. Physically, I'll go ahead and jump there and just make the connection here. This is where I was sitting down with my wife and asking that question, Heather, how can I love, serve you better? And about a year and a half ago, when, when I was asking her that question, one night she looked at me and she said immediately, she said, you can take better care of yourself physically. Because if you don't make some changes, you're not going to be around very long to love me or serve me and your kids. She said, you eat horrible, you don't exercise, and you don't sleep. And I realized that these things were displaying not only a lack of honor for my God, but love for my wife and my children. So I started making changes in the way I eat and exercising and creating some boundaries so I wasn't staying up all night, sometimes multiple times a week. And Brothers, I want to exhort you to take responsibility physically for your life and your family. Some of you, with the way you eat, with the way you don't exercise, obviously we know that, that none of us, not even the healthiest among us, is guaranteed tomorrow. But the reality is you are a steward of the body you have been given, and you owe it to your wife and your children to steward that body well, if not for your good, at least for their good. To take responsibility in the same way for the physical health of your family. That together you might love the Lord with all your strength and honor God as temples of the Holy Spirit. Intellectually, take responsibility for shepherding your family to know God, to love God with all their minds. Relationally, take responsibility for the social health of your family, for relationships within your family. Dads, show your sons what it looks like to love and serve a wife well. Show your daughters what it looks like to be loved and served by a husband well. In your family, beyond your family, show your family. Shepherd them to care about those in need and neighbors around you. You say, ah, oh, this, this takes a lot of time. How do you do this? This is where we realize we don't have time for all of our hobbies and our sports and our games and our shows that we thought we had time for because we're actually giving our time now to things that matter to people who actually matter. 
see it. This is what the cross compels us to do. Jesus took responsibility for our salvation, for leading us to the Father. So in him, we take responsibility for starting family, shepherding a family, leading family to the Father. Strive for purity. Take responsibility. Provide. 1 Timothy 5.8. If a man does not provide for the needs of his family, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. First and te- Second Thessalonians talk about men who don't work. Stay away from them, it says. Proverbs 6 talks about men who are lazy. Men, we work hard to provide because this is what we were created to do. Now, this is, I want to be careful. This is not by any means saying that it's wrong for a woman to work outside the home in every circumstance. That they're, and it's not saying... There aren't some rare circumstances where maybe because of a disability or disease struggle that a a brother has physically that keeps him from work, that he's no longer a man because he's not able to be the provider of for, for his home. The point is that even that man in that situation still feels an accountability for this and desires to provide and works to provide in any and every way he can. Provide, protect. All these verses that I've listed here in parentheses, describe men protecting their families, in some cases leading out in battle. And that's, that's the picture, not even just in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. We live in a spiritual world. We're involved in a spiritual war. So fight the battle, brothers, on all fronts, physically, spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, to protect others in your home, beyond your home. Honor women. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman, so that your prayers may not be hindered. You hear that? Honor women, men, for if you don't, God will not hear you. Men, you spend your life taking advantage of women, women in all kinds of ways, emotionally, sexually, whether it's your girlfriend or your wife or somebody online, you take advantage of his daughters and God will turn away from you. He will not hear from you. Honor women and train boys to be men. Dads, husbands, single men. Show boys. Let's show boys what godly responsibility, humble initiative, hardworking leadership look like in action. Show them this is what the cross compels us to do. This is a huge need across our church. Scott was praying for this earlier. For older men in a Titus 2 type way, we need to take responsibility for showing younger men what this look like looks like. We know there is such a lack of models in our culture here. And we need to take these kinds of initiative in relationships with younger men. The cross compels us to initiate humble, hardworking leadership in our lives. And the cross compels us to show selfless, sacrificial love for our wives. So husbands, Ephesians 5, 22-33, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands, well, how did Christ love the church? He gave himself up for her. Give yourself up for her. Gentlemen, headship is not an opportunity for you to control your wife. It is a responsibility for you to die for your wife. Every day to die, to lift her up. The thought of headship in marriage should cause every man in this room to tremble. The last thing a man should ever do is joke about being the head of his wife. You are the head in the sense that you laid down your wife, your life for your wife, just like Christ was crucified on a bloody cross. The world tells you to be a man is to be macho. Defend yourself. Assert yourself. Bring attention to yourself. Live for yourself. The Bible says sacrifice yourself for your wife. This is manhood. Love your wife faithfully. Do we realize, husbands, do we realize the responsibility we have? God has designed marriage, specifically our relationship as head, to our wives, to reflect Christ's relationship as head and his love for the church. We are telling the world what Christ is like by the way we love our wives. So men, if you leave your wife You are saying to the world that Christ deserts his people. Husbands, if you are harsh with your wife, you are saying to the world that Christ is harsh with his people. Husbands, you ignore your wife. You're you're saying to the world that Christ wants nothing to do with his people. Do we realize how serious this picture is? It's astonishing how for a few moments of sexual pleasure, faithless men can bring themselves to slander the very faithfulness of Christ before the world. 
What picture is your marriage giving to the world about Christ and His church right now? This is why we're faithful. Not because the feeling's always there, not because it's always easy, but because the covenant of Christ among His people is at stake before a lost and dying world. This is why we stay married. Love your wife faithfully. Love your wife effectively. Christ loves the church in a way that makes her holy and pure and blameless. So this is how we love our wives, in a way that they grow in loveliness. Husbands, we are responsible before God for leading our marriages to be holy and leading our wives to be lovely. How do we do that? By laying down our lives for them. That's what it means to be the head of family. Love your wife effectively. Love your wife carefully. Ephesians 5, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. I love this. Paul almost just appeals to our selfishness here, men. He's like, men, men, you know how much you care about yourself? Well, care about your wife that way. Nourish her. The language there is emotional, even evocative. Cherish her. The word literally means to keep her warm, to comfort her. Never be harsh with your wife. The t- Bible tells us to love our wives carefully because God knows that men in our sinfulness will take this headship thing and use it to debase them. And God says, never use your position as head in your family to debase your wife. Use it to treasure your wife. To serve her, love her carefully and love your wife completely. The cross compels us to love our wives completely in a one flesh union with them. Huh. I, I know this a lot. We covered a lot of ground tonight. We've seen, in a sense, just huge responsibilities that might feel just heaped upon men. The kind of responsibilities that we would be totally unable to carry out on our own. Some of you may be thinking, well, I, just, I can't do all this. I, I, I just can't do it. But if that's what you think, realize that is the point. That's, that's the point. It's the point of the cross and Christian manhood. We cannot be the men God has created us to be on our own. We have tried that in our culture and we have failed miserably. And not just in our culture, but in the church. And so, on this Father's Day, men, we find ourselves driven to the cross Because the cross compels us to a desperate dependence on grace that only Christ can give. To be a man is to be found in Christ. We cannot be men apart from Him. So so this is where tonight men all across this room I want to call you in a fresh way, maybe for the first time for some of you, but universally call you to the cross of Christ to see your sinful tendencies as a man and to realize that apart from Christ, you will never be the man God has created you to be. Throw aside your pride tonight. Humble yourself before Him. Maybe for the first time to turn from your sin and yourself and to trust in Jesus to save you from your sin. If you've never done that, I urge you men to do that tonight. Be forgiven of all your sin by Him. Free to become the man that He has designed you to be. If you have trusted in Him, Christian men, To leave behind the lies our culture has sold us that we have bought regarding what it means to be a man and to say, Jesus, I need you by your grace to make me into the man that you've designed for me to be. I want to call men to that at the same time. I mentioned this at the beginning for women all across this room. Thank you for overhearing this, first of all. I hope you know how better to pray for men around you. But whether you are single or married, when you think about the men around you, whether it's a husband or other men who surround you, you know that not one of us is perfect. 
And, and you know that there are sinful tendencies in our hearts. And so I want to call you to the same place that I'm calling men to. I want to call you to the cross. I want to call you in a fresh way to the perfect man. To put your faith and your hope and your trust in the perfect man. In Christ. Especially if you in your life have been hurt by these kinds of men that we've talked about. Abusive men or men who have ignored you or abdicated their responsibility for you in all of these different ways who are doing that even now maybe in your life. I want to urge you not to say, well, if I can just find the perfect guy, I want you to come. I want to invite you to come to the perfect man, Christ, and find in him the only man who will ultimately satisfy your soul. I invite you to come to the cross tonight where men find themselves. Let's find themselves there as women too. And, and let's rejoice in the grace that is available to all of us in him.